Good morning, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen of ConocoPhillips. Thank you very much for your, your invitation to join you here today to speak on your Global Safety Conference. Uh, my subject today is safety culture and empowerment, but let me first introduce myself. My name is Bruce Staley, I'm a safety management consultant, but I spent most of my working life in coal mines. I'm a mining engineer, originally by profession, and spent 24 years, eight, nine hundred meters below the ground in the dark. My family for 300 years, maybe more, worked in coal mines. But let me tell you a little bit about what I do today. I consult around the world in high risk and labor intensive industries. I work in coal mining still, uh, shipbuilding, iron and steel, railways, major construction, heavy engineering, power generation, nuclear power, chemicals. I even work for two zoo companies and I specialize in tiger, rhinoceros, gorilla and elephant. I also work for the oil industry. I work for most of the super majors, some of the mid-sized oil companies, many of the national oil companies around the world as well, for the drilling companies and, and the service companies. And though as a company we, we advise governments in two or three different countries, for vastly different reasons, we, we advise judges in high courts, but they were all mining disasters. We spend most of our ta time training, coaching, advising leadership, helping leaders with a better understanding of this subject, helping them gain knowledge and eventually then develop the skills which enable those leaders to be much more effective in moving safety to the next level of performance. Now I my subject matter today is, is safety culture and the empowerment of a workforce. And just going back to the statement I made earlier about my family being 300 years in coal mines. Well, I started underground when I was, just before I was 18. My father started underground when he was 14. My grandfather started underground when he was nine, nine years of age. That's when he started work. In a country which at the time was as civilized as anywhere else and People at the age of nine were sent underground. Probably the most dangerous work environment you could ever find and they were employing children. It tells you something a little bit about culture. Now the word culture, to understand maybe better what I'm going to be speaking about for the next 45 minutes or so. To understand that word, there are many different definitions of that word. And, and, and the one that, I've, that I hold and, and keep in my mind it breaks down a culture into five words. Now, culture is all about people. It's got nothing to do with anything else but people. And so it talks to the behaviors of people, the attitudes, the competences, the perceptions and the values of those people, shared behaviors, competences, attitudes, values and perceptions. And so if we were then to compare one culture with another, then we would in some way assess those under those five different parameters and then bring those together to make some comparisons to how one culture might differ from another. It may be a national culture, it may be a company culture, it might be an industry culture, it might be a sporting culture, comparing in my country a cricket team with a football team, the one that you kick with your foot. Okay, so and so why is that critical to a, for us to talk about it on a conference? A conference about safety. Why is, why is culture such an important word today? Over the years, we've, we've challenged the safety problem in different ways. Historically, if you look back through history, originally the, our approach was through en engineering. Maybe the first 150 years. If you look at the history of industry for the first 150 years, you'll see industry concentrating so much upon the engineering of safety. There was a lot of need for it, tremendous amount of need. There was the guard and the physical barrier that stopped people falling or coming into contact with energies. And then they became more and more sophisticated. Okay? And if you look out on the roads today, you will see, as I came along, I-10, which comes through Houston, which is not far away from these offices today. And when I look at the, the road today, I see the engineering of safety. I see the great road, level and smooth and straight, a good long curves and barriers and lights and drainage. I see the engineered car, big and strong and airbag, ABS, seat belt, rollover protection, all the engineering you could ever want. And then maybe you look at my country, 
on the road there, where we concentrate an awful lot more, though we've got our good engineering, we concentrate an awful lot more on the rule and the procedure and the policy and the standard <coughs> and the training of people. And we've got cameras at every corner that enforces the rule of the road. And so we're, we're, we're disciplined uh, uh, along the road and our behaviours are disciplined that way. And of course then we'll go to other countries who pray to God every day to, to look after their safety as well. And maybe that happens in every country. But there are different approaches. But the one that we're here today to talk about is, is the behaviours of people. And maybe again those, those five words that make up culture, it's the behaviours, ultimately the behaviours of people that determine whether a company is successful in safety or not. <coughs> we can have good attitudes and competencies <coughs> and values and perceptions, but ultimately it's the way that people behave. I have seen, witnessed the most competent, knowledgeable and skilled people in industry, knowing all there is to know about safety, but at times, for some strange reason, doing the wrong thing. And their behaviour ultimately ends up with their own injury or the injuries of many other people. The whole aim of creating a sound safety culture is to try to build in some reliability, some predictability, some compliance almost into the behaviours of people, especially in a high-risk industry, where one false move could mean the difference between a broken arm or even a disaster. And so concentrating around the culture and the behaviours of people is, is what my presentation is more about today than anything. Why people? Well, it is my belief that all of this subject is about people. But once upon a time, I quoted 98, 99, I'm, I'm as close to 100% as you can get. It is my belief that 100%, 99.9 recurring percentage of this whole subject is about people. Now, that's, to some people, that's, that's a challenge to accept that. But after all the years I've spent in industry, I am pretty well convinced. I, I travel a different country and a different industry and a different culture every week, looking for that point zero zero one that might be something else other than people. The only challenges I ever get to that statement are maybe one of two. One would be engineering. But how can you en blame engineering when we designed it? We made it, we quality controlled it, sold it, we bought it, we transported it, we installed it, we used it, abused it, maintained it or didn't. You cannot blame engineering. It's 100% about people. I say, is a forklift truck a dangerous piece of equipment? People say, yes, it is. I challenge that. Because a forklift truck, if it sits here out in the car park, all it will do is rust away. That's all that happens. Until when? Until somebody gets anywhere near it. They don't even have to get in the driving seat. I've known people who have serious accidents just tripping over the forks. And then we'll go in a different direction. The other challenge that comes to my 100% would be the act of God and the freak of nature. And I say, well, give me an example. And they'll say, earthquake. I say, well, can you blame earthquakes in Japan? Can you blame earthquakes in San Francisco? Or in Istanbul? Places where earthquakes have been living there for th millions of years. Very difficult for to blame them because we choose to live in those places. We choose to build buildings. We choose to operate industry, whatever it might be. But you cannot blame earthquakes because that's where they live in those places. We choose. And you can't blame hurricanes here on the Gulf of Mexico because I'm sure they've been living here for millions of years as well. And how long have people been building and rebuilding their houses and choosing to live and, and spend their lives in these places? In the same way that it's difficult to blame lightning from black sky. Because that's where it lives and we choose. And you can't blame high pressure oil and gas in the strata below the, the Earth's crust because that high pressure oil and gas would happily have stayed there. But we chose. We chose to go and drill for it. Very, very difficult to blame it. When it suddenly decides to burst up through our drill string and, and explode in the atmosphere. So these two challenges, I find them very difficult to, uh, to accept that they would make up even the most fraction of a percentage. Maybe, maybe the lightning from blue sky and a, and a meteorite, but they're very, very rare and I, I can hardly think they'd make much of a difference on 100%. So as far as I'm concerned, this whole subject's about people. Every last little drop of it. 
So why not then create this great culture that's based upon people's competence and attitudes, ultimately uh, ending up with, with the finest of behaviours in a workplace? Well, the challenge is great. There are many obstacles. There are barriers to this, to this, whole, this whole subject of getting people to behave in the right way. The three main ones, the three that I have certainly have discovered in my working life, and let me take you through them. The first one I, I really came very clear to me was 16 years ago. I left the mining industry, the first job I got was working for a zoo company. They had two zoos. They'd lost three people with tigers and two with elephants. And the government were going to take away their license to operate, and the reason they'd invited me was to help them put some sort of structure uh, to help them create some sort of safety culture within that organisation. Fantastic zoos. The, the, the well-being and mental physical health of their wild animals was superb, but the safety of their people was not good. But the story I want to tell you was, one evening sat with a man called Nick Marks. He was the head keeper of Tigers, a man of my own age. He'd run away from home and school when he was 15, joined the zoo, worked with Tigers, hands-on, all his life. And he convinced me, one evening, that Tigers are far more predictable in their behaviour than human beings, far more predictable. He said, a tiger, you can tell from what time of day it is, how it will behave. If the weather changes, how it will change. What it's doing now, what it will do next. He said, you can read them like a book. Very predictable in their behaviours. He said, far more predictable than human beings. And then he said, and you've got human beings walking around loose in your workplace. Very unpredictable people. In fact, I remember in that evening saying that it would be far better at the zoo if you could put the, the people uh, in the cages and, and have the, the animals walking outside. It would be far more, far more easy to manage. So we're unpredictable. Second problem. We're not naturally safe. You can sit a shelf on that wall and some sweets and a baby on the floor. What will the baby do? It'll climb. Maybe halfway it falls, bumps, bruises, cries, but the baby's okay. What does it do next? Climb again. And again. Because we are no way, shape or form born safe. It is not natural to us. It's not inbuilt. Safety is not innate. What is natural? From the first minute we take our first breath, what is natural is risk. We are born, bred, innate, built in, risk takers. It is the only way we got out of caves, the only way we climb mountains, ski down the other side with planks of wood on our feet, frighten ourselves to death, get on the lift, go back and have another go. It is the only way we flew the first aeroplanes, only way you got to the moon. It's the only way that people drill for high pressure oil and gas with 20% H2S because we are born bred innate risk takers. Natural to us, it is the only way that civilization advances. By pushing the boundaries, by going to places and doing things that we, we've never done before and, and never know whether it's going to be successful or not, but we will do it because it is the only way that in the future civilization will survive. But apart from risk being natural, we are also rewarded for it. You imagine driving home tonight. If you drive home taking risk, what is your reward? You get home early. Your dinner is not burned. The family are happy to see you. The football did not start on TV yet. More time to rest, more time to do the things that you want to do. What about the rewards that you get as you are driving and taking risk? Can you imagine the rewards then? Just in the car, putting your foot down and, and launching out onto the highway in front of that crowd of traffic that's coming and you get in front of them. And the adrenaline is coursing through your system, overtaking the man in the Porsche and feeling that you're winning the race. And going through those traffic lights on a sort of an orangey-red colour and you're away and he's behind you. And you got home early. And all those rewards that come from taking risk. And risk which is natural to us. And remember we're not naturally safe. Now can anybody tell me what is the reward of safety? And I would imagine you out there now are working very hard to find the answer to that question. 
Some people will say life. I'm sorry, no. Safety does not give you life because you've already got it. A reward is something you are given over and above what you've already got. You've already got life. What we normally say is that safety enables us to go home in the evening time in the same shape as we came in the morning. In other words, there is no reward. You just get to keep what you've got. And can you see Conoco Phillips trying to instill safety into their broader workforce? People who are not naturally safe, they are not rewarded for it, and it fights every minute of every day against risk which is natural to them and which they are rewarded for. You see why this is so tough? We are natural risk takers to differing degrees, but we're natural risk takers. There's a third problem. Also natural. You imagine today that Mr. Mulver, he's your chief executive. You imagine he, he builds a factory for us. We all work for him today and he builds us a factory and he brings us all to the factory and he's got all those good machines and he teaches and trains us all to feed the machines, to maintain the machines, to manufacture and produce to the highest of standards. He shares his values with us. Every day he ensures we maintain his standards and deliver to his procedures word perfect. And after three months, we work into perfection. Our behaviours are predictable, reliable, conformist in some way, shape or form. But after three months, he decided, that's it. He has created that reliable culture where people behave in that predictable way. And so then he goes and sits in his office. And he doesn't come back to see us. What will happen to those high standards? What will happen to that predictable behaviour? And I know what you're saying now. It's going to drop off. The question is why? Why when we're not visited, as it were? When we're left to our own devices in the workplace? Why do we lower the standards? Why do we shortcut the procedure? Why do we sort of swap out and modify our values? One other natural trait. We're lazy. To differing degrees as well. Some of us can be lazy till four o'clock in the afternoon and get up and do work for an hour maybe. Because we feel too guilty. Some have to start work earlier in the day. But in some way, shape or form, to some degree, lazy. And so can you see a challenge. The challenge that Mr. Mulver's got is to instill a safety culture into an organisation, into people where unpredictability faces us every day. We're risk takers. And we've got a bit of laziness thrown in there as well. And all those things don't make for an easy challenge. When people's behaviours are so critical for the success of a high-risk organisation or a high-risk industry like yours, and dealing with a raw product, the raw product of people. So what do organisations do? Again, coming down I-10, seeing all of that good engineering, seeing and knowing and understanding all the rules and all the procedures and all of the training and the standards and the competences and the licensing of people and the inspection of cars and maintenance of roads. I saw all of that. But every now and then I put my hand up to my eyes and say, how on earth did they get away with that? Because somebody was doing something that was very unpredictable. <laughs> Maybe lazy in some way, shape or form because they weren't indicating their, their intentions. And certainly taking risk. How does an organisation then combat that? I work with many oil companies. And when I look across them, oil companies or any industrial enterprise, I find managers' safety in a similar way, in the set of similar building blocks. I see similar engineering standards across the oil industry. I see similar rules, procedures, standards, ways of working predictably documented, laid down in writing. I see training as well, I see common training across the industry. I see company training which aligns very much with others. You do that because your service companies which work across your company have to have some common approach in order, in order for them to be successful because they work with different companies every week and so somehow there's been a levelling. 
And so across the oil industry, I see those common rules and standards, common engineering to a great extent, and training as well. So how do you get to the next level? And by the way, each of those three that I've talked about are not the ones which influence your culture, because I can tell you of some of my clients who have the finest of engineering and, and the finest of procedures, but their culture is seriously lacking. So it isn't they, and even the training, it isn't they that really instill the safety culture. It's some of those softer issues. The motivations. The motivation that exists within an organisation to, to encourage people's safe behaviour. The communication that goes on with the organisation, which ensures that people understand that safety is critical to that organisation. And it's not a once a month discussion in a safety meeting. It's something which just percolates through every day. Not special, not just at the front of the first of a meeting, not, not just first thing in the morning, but something that, a word that percolates throughout the whole day. The discussion's about risk. Risk awareness itself, we might call that a a softer issue as well. Risk awareness, so critical, so, so difficult to maintain, by the way, in a successful company, ConocoPhillips, having a, a good reputation for their safety and already having established a good safety culture and the, and the results have come, but, but the problem with success is that complacency sets in. So how do you maintain that healthy fear, that respect for hazard and risk in everybody every day? Because once you've lost that, then hey, people start to do silly things. And responsibilities. People having clear in their minds their responsibilities. Being held accountable, not, not waiting until somebody's had an accident to hold them accountable, but hold them accountable on a, on a frequent basis. Supporting them, in other words. Checking them out to make sure that they, they are supported. That things have been provided. Make sure there's nothing getting in their way. And supporting and holding them accountable on a, on a frequent basis. Accountable for their success rather than waiting for failure. And then always being ready to apply good discipline to those that don't want to join in. Because those people who don't want to join in with your culture. We need to find those people. And give them one chance, maybe give them a second. But be very cautious about ever giving them a third. Because in a high-risk industry, the person that's taking risk, in my experience, may be taking risk for themselves today. But you beware, because they'll be taking risk for the rest of us tomorrow. And I've seen, I've known people who've been in bed, fast asleep, when the explosion occurred, that they had set a trap by their behaviours. And many others suffered it. Talk about motivation then first. Positive motivation. Positive motivation is rewarding people for the right behaviours. And then ultimately rewarding those who go above and beyond as well. Why do we reward people? We don't reward people for a feel-good factor. We don't re reward people to... For success, actually, we reward people basically to encourage them to continue to behave in that good way. So if we see those good behaviours in the workplace, then recognising those good behaviours by our words in simple ways, it doesn't mean, we have, don't, don't ever think you're going to buy safety. People have this strange idea that putting big bonuses and, 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 and fancy prizes will, will, make the, uh, will make the difference. People's having the attention of their leadership is just as powerful as any money you put in somebody's pocket. By a leader going out just into a workplace and recognising somebody for their good behaviours is, will cement that behaviour. We like to be praised. And tomorrow, knowing full well that our boss isn't going to praise us again for the same behaviour, then we're looking for something, something more. And that's what positive motivation is all about. It builds relationships between leadership and the workforce. It opens up communication, it builds confidence, and it creates a preoccupation with improvement. But there are parts of the world that I travel where 
the leader would have no more interest in, in, in rewarding somebody or even praising somebody for those good behaviours. So it, it exists out there. You'll be working in cultures, national cultures, where positive motivation is, is, is at the end of a scale, a low end of a scale. In those countries, again, and, and, and I work in those countries, where negative motivation was the order of the day, where people were punished and penalised for their mistakes or, or, their, or their wrong behaviour. And you can imagine now somebody working for me. I find them doing something wrong. I find them making a mistake. And I'm the manager and I punish them for that mistake. What has that done for our relationship? Destroyed it. What has it done for our communication? It has broken it. And what does that person become preoccupied with? Well, I'll tell you. They'll be preoccupied with avoiding me or hiding their failures because if that person fails another time or makes a mistake the last thing they're ever going to do is tell me about it and you imagine somebody who's maybe a welder can you remember can you imagine a welder who is welding gas pipelines who made a mistake and I punish that person can you imagine the next time they make a mistake on a high-pressure gas line on a weld and it gets through the system yes and they breathe aside they probably put a number of coats of paint to hide it and then you know what's going to happen as a result of that. Negative motivation is very dangerous. From a safety point of view, I think it's very destructive right across industry. And it exists in spadefuls out there. Negative motivation is the tool of an incompetent leader. The competent leader builds, builds his, his relationships and his communication and success around positive motivation. And that's something we could get... We could build and, and become, more, become better at ourselves as leaders. Risk awareness. I said earlier that, that success is a dangerous place to be because success says to people, I've done it a thousand times, I never got injured, therefore I never will, therefore risk has disappeared. And lulls us into a false sense of security. And anybody that works out, walks out onto a drill rig or a, onto an offshore platform, into a an oil refinery in their minds that no, nothing can go wrong because we've never had an accident for months and months and years. It's a very dangerous person to be walking into a place with such high risk all about them. Maintaining, maintaining that healthy respect, that fear almost, a level of healthy fear and respect for hazard and risk is so critical. Every day people walking into the workplace, eyes open, looking for what might have changed. Not blindly going down that path of doing the job and, and, and following the procedure and, and understanding the risk as it's written, but being aware that all of a sudden the weather changed. And the wind came from a different direction. And that made a tremendous difference to the way they were going to do their job that day. But if they're not aware that a simple change in wind directs can, can make so much difference to the risk they're exposed to, then it will just blow straight past them. And that then could be the cause of that next injury, maybe even disaster. Who knows? Maintaining risk awareness is, a, I believe, more an art form than it ever is a science. How do we maintain that healthy fear, not by just showing people videos and photographs every day because ultimately you just become blase about that as well, you don't see it anymore. There is, there are mechanisms, discussion, maybe about the accident that nearly happened today and talking about the real life and, and Joe and, 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 and just having that little discussion in the morning or during the shift about what could have happened, what could have been the consequence, and it's the word consequence, what I call the blood on the floor people willing to have that conversation about what it might have meant, what sort of injury and then the suffering it could have, it could have caused. And I don't mean to be sensational, and I don't mean to force people down this road, but just every now and then, just that little drop of consequence could be the, mean the difference between that complacency and that healthy fear and respect for risk. Communication. Again, communication in the workplace, so, so critical, again, to, to success and, and building a sound safety culture. 
There are parts of the world where I travel, safety uh, cultures, national cultures, industry cultures. It's not so long I walked into the workplace uh, with a leader in one part of the world. And when we walked out there, people ran away and hid, literally, ran away. There are parts of the world where the cultures of industry have, have created such a fear in the workforce of their leadership and what the leadership might do to them and the punishment they might uh, put upon them has caused uh, a workforce in parts of the world to distrust their leadership. Now, how do you overcome that? I work with those leaders. I take them to the workplace. I help them to build relationships with the workforce. Doesn't matter whether it's the person who is sweeping up, or the worst person who is welding or crane driving, whoever it might be, but to approach them in such a way, in an open, unthreatening, respectful way, that may then just be sufficient for that person to start to build some sort of confidence and trust that maybe this person does care. Because there are parts of the world where the value that's placed on the life of working people is not so high. And they've felt that and known that for, for many generations, and, but now is the time for change. But it'll start with a leader who goes out there with a look on his face which is a pleasure to meet those people. Those people are so critical for all of our success, whether it's production and quality and cost or anything else, but 100% critical for our safety success. And going out there, maybe with their hands open, with a positive look upon their face, in an open and threatening way, and meeting those people. You don't need to meet everyone, you just need to meet a few, because come the first break, come the first cup of coffee, that conversation will have spread through many, many more people. But you've got to take that first step. And there are many parts of the world where communication for safety or communication at all is, is, is sadly lacking. The experts in safety do not sit in offices. If there's anybody in this organization that say, think they're a safety expert because they sit in an office with the word safety on the door, then they've got to think twice. The safety experts are out there. Some of them have been working 30 and 40 years welding, driving cranes, and having to scar. Some have got scars and they learned the hard way, but they know the right way. Get out there, meet those people, have those great conversations because the successes that we're going to get in the future are going to come from them. They're through their engagement and their involvement and their good ideas, through our good communication in the workplace, is how we're going to move forward. And that is also the place where you will apply those positive motivations and maybe have those conversations about the blood and, that, and the consequences of safety. And then finally, uh, I talked about responsibility and accountability. I find, again, in industry, uh, organizations that don't do a good job in explaining in simple terms the safety responsibilities of individuals. They leave in broad terms, but broad terms don't help when you're in a workplace and facing risk. People need to have the conversation which describes those responsibilities in practical terms should have those responsibilities resourced maybe by the support of others, the people who they can call on, maybe equipment and procedures and rules, maybe with some training as well. But too often we've sent those people out into the workplace without, with a job title and some broad brush feeling words around a responsibility but don't do those other things well. And, and because of that, they walk forward into risk, not really knowing what, who they could turn to and what equipment they should have available to what standards and rules are the ones that really mean something to them, rather than this book that sits on a shelf which frightens them. And so we need to do a better job there. Accountability, a word which is grossly misunderstood around the world. Accountability, to many people, believe is a word that comes into action once somebody's done something wrong, once somebody's failed, and we're going to hold them accountable, it is not. That is not the definition of that word. The word accountability is a visiting process, visiting people who have been given responsibilities, visiting them at a regular frequency, holding them accountable for the performance that we've described to them, we expect from them, and before they fail, helping them and supporting them to fulfill those responsibilities calling upon them and finding out what's getting in the way and supporting them and helping them maybe with something that you could do to give them some more training, a clarity around a rule, a standard, some better support they could turn to, some equipment they may need 
Helping them with that in order to gain success. Accountability for success, not storming in the first time they failed and beating them up because the accountability process says we should. No, it doesn't. Accountability is visiting and ensuring success. And then thirdly, I talked about discipline. You will find those that don't want to join in. And in a high-risk industry, they're very dangerous. And you certainly want to find out about those people before the accident, because the accident could be a disaster. And so visiting the workplace and meeting your people will give you a better understanding of those that maybe don't want to join in. You can see by the look on their face, on their face, you can see by their reluctance to have the conversation, um, you'll find them. And maybe having that conversation to find out whether they're happy to be here, working in these standards or not, might be the best way of helping them find somewhere else that might be a better place for them but not in a high-risk industry, where the lives of many people could be at risk. Ladies and gentlemen, I come to... It's a big subject. I've hit, I've hit some high spots. We've talked about culture. We've talked about the barriers to cultural change. We've talked about the mechanisms that organizations use, and I've talked about some of those, the softer ones, which are the ones most critical for moving, for moving a culture on, and giving you some insights into those. Let me just close my presentation with a, a couple of warnings, I suppose. I travel broadly around the world. I've already said that in many industries, many companies, and over the last 16 years consulting, I have seen massive change. I see now around the world, in your industry, as much and not more so than many others, leaders who spend all day sat in an office, and I don't talk about executives, I'm talking about managers and supervisors. Supervisors spending all day sat in offices. The administrative burden that you're placed, that industry places every day upon leadership, we call them, these managers and supervisors, so critical for the everyday maintenance of a safety culture, are spending all day in, a, in, in an office. And I'll tell you now, my experience in life is you will never do safety from an office. You could talk it to death in meetings, you can write emails and more procedures and nothing changes out there if we're going to sustain or even move our safety performance on, it will not be done by sitting in offices. And if there's one word of warning, you have to look very carefully at your organization and liberating your leadership to get them out in the workplace because at the moment they're sitting in offices. And the second one. A leaders, a, a, an organization like Conica Phillips would want to succeed in many ways. Of course, they have to produce. Critical for their success, otherwise there's nothing to sell, no profit to make. The quality of that product and service, again, of the highest order, for people to have confidence in you and, and to come back and, and buy your, your product and your service again. The cost, the balance of cost and, 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 and generating profit that can be ploughed back into your organisation and to satisfy your shareholders and your major investors. And your employee relations. Every day, making sure to your best abilities that your people are happy. And then you'll get that reliable, consistent workforce rather than changing them out every, every year for somebody else. And so keeping your people happy. And traditionally, if you've succeeded in those four ways, then you were a successful organization. Production, quality, cost, employee relations. But if you failed in any of those, the downside was purely financial. But in this modern age, we have another challenge, and that is to succeed in health, safety, and environment. The interesting thing is, the bottom line of that subject is not money, it's human life. And you fail in that one, people suffer serious injury and death and destroy families. And that's majorly different to these. These are only money, and these you can make better. And this is not, this is human life. And I would suggest to you today that to fail in health, safety, and environment has now become the fastest way to cripple or bring a business to an end. Conoco's safety culture of the future is all about its people. It's all about building some, by many different mechanisms, a reliability, predictability into those people's behaviors to ultimately bring us to that place 
of zero accidents, which I truly believe in, because if we can do it for one day, then we can do it for two. And seven would make a week, and 31 would make a month. And do that for 365 days, and there's a year of zero. How about that? I'll leave you with that thought. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dr. Staley, a quick question. When, when you walk into an organization, what are the key signs that tell you that that organization has a robust safety culture? Okay. When I walk into a workplace, as I do most every day with a, a manager, an executive with me, I walk into their workplaces. And the reason I'm there is maybe to coach a leader, but equally to give them some understanding of that culture. It's something you, that I've got grown used to, so I've, I've got a fairly keen eye. I, don't, I do spend a little bit of time looking at physical standards. Physical standards give you an indicator. You, you, if you look around you for some order, some tidiness, some maintenance, it gives you a good feeling. But it's ultimately about the people, as we've said. And so then you've got to walk forward through the hardware and, and to the people. Now, I'll give you an ex a good example of a conversation I had just recently in, in, in the Middle East. I walked onto a drill rig with the vice president of that company. We walked onto the drill floor. I saw the good physical standard, the, the maintenance, the cleanliness, the, 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 the general order. But my interest was with the driller. And I walked towards him, and they were stood down at the time, and I met with the driller. I said to him, I said, um, what is your biggest safety challenge here? And he said, H2S. Straight away, with no misunderstanding. He, 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 th th it was the first thing on his lips. I said, why, what could happen? He said, we could have a blowout. This is a high pressure, high H2S well. I said, well, what would be the consequences of that? He said, everyone south of here will die. He had no misunderstanding. And I said, Brian, let's call him Brian. I said, Brian, what do you do to make sure that doesn't happen? And within a matter of minutes, he had taken me through every gauge and valve and monitor in such a clear, confident, systematic, routine way that I had no misunderstanding that that man had all that I would need as a leader to be able to walk away with confidence that there was people there in charge with great knowledge and understanding and confidence and great awareness of the risks that in the event that something was going wrong, they would deal with it so professionally, so, so efficiently. And so it's about the people. It's about their confidence and their knowledge and their, and their logical thought flows and their ability to explain that to others as well. That gives me the confidence that we're growing that culture that's got that reliability and predictability about it. If you were going to do maybe two or three things to make a step change in safety culture for an organization, what would you do? My answer is going to be radical, okay, and there'll be people around the world that are going to be drawing deep breaths, but I'm going to tell you what they are. They are radical, and please look at them at face value, but then see what I'm saying behind. I'd do two things. I'd stop all accident investigations, and I'd stop all safety meetings that are ever held within a set of offices. Now, that's radical, so I better explain myself. First of all, Action investigations. Why do we do an action investigation? We tell ourselves we do it in order to learn. But if I were say, to say to you that in all my experience of accidents, there are no new accidents. So you tell me what are you going to learn? You're just going to learn that you still aren't doing the things you know you should be doing. Second, people practice for their accidents. They don't have an accident, they don't have it perfect on the first day. They lean a little further until they become perfect at it. I saw them practicing out on I-10 today. One of them would become perfect soon. Now, a leader that goes out the day after an accident demonstrates their interest in accidents. It is the leader that goes out the day before, looking for those behaviors that we already know will produce our accident, looking for those people who are practicing and stopping them. The leader that goes out the day before an accident demonstrates their interest in safety. Now, safety meetings. Again, I spent hours, days, months, I imagine, in my life in safety meetings. Debating, discussing uh, safety to death, as it were, for hours on end. But nothing changed. I believe that the best safety meetings we'll ever have in the years to come are, are not three hours in a, in a room with a small group of people, but out in a workplace. Going out there, one or two, to meet up with 
people engaged in a high-risk activity and having a short meeting with them of four or five minutes about the risks involved with that job, about the consequences if they fail, and letting them describe all of the good things they're doing and what else they might do and what support they might need in order to reach the next level of performance, the best safety meeting you could ever have with the experts, on the job, at the time, facing risk, no misunderstandings because you can point and show and demonstrate exactly what we're talking about. And then, there and then, agreeing some change. And then moving on and having another safety meeting of another five minutes with another group of people. That's my answer. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for inviting me. Good day. <laughs>